Welcome everyone to the Yo Bro Gaming and Review Channel. I am Zach and welcome to the first episode of a special 10 part series, the Road to WrestleMania series. Now, if you've been living under a rock and you don't already know, what this is is my top 10 WrestleManias, not just moments, not just matches, but the entirety of the WrestleMania. Now, some of the matches that I watch in these aren't exactly what I call WrestleMania worthy. But, I will say this, they are still better than what I saw at the other WrestleManias. So, this is the first of the 10 WrestleManias. This is number 10 on my list, and that's WrestleMania 23. And this one took place on April 1st, 2007, in Detroit, Michigan, at Ford Field, where they had a crowd of about 80,000 people, which is not anything small. This WrestleMania was built around Shawn Michaels and John Cena. Although Undertaker had won the Royal Rumble, they decided to put that match on last. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the Undertaker match. But it did kind of irk me just a little bit. But, um, you know, they... They made a big deal because it was in the same state as WrestleMania 3 and how they set the attendance there. And they wanted to set another attendance record and that didn't pan out. But anyways, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go on with this review. I got a lot to cover. Like I said, I'm covering the entire card. Some matches I'll talk about more than I will others. It just depends on my preference because that's what this is. It's my WrestleManias and it's what I wanted. And I just hope you all enjoy this. So they start this off with a... Nice little video package. Um, it's they, they called this All Grown Up. That was kind of the theme for WrestleMania. And they started off with the WrestleMania intro with Vince McMahon telling me, you know, welcome to WrestleMania 3. And they used his voice to introduce Aretha Franklin, who was doing America the Beautiful again. And for a woman at that time who was her age, was still wonderfully done. Very nice. Then they had the intro package, you know, for the the wrestlers and I'm sorry, the superstars, and kind of a setup for all the matches. And it was it was all right. But the first match, and at the time when they were still doing Money in the Bank at WrestleMania, it was probably my favorite part of the show. <clears throat> Well, I need a drink here soon. Uh, and this, yeah, it was the Money in the Bank. And it, I, I'm sorry, you'll see me looking down occasionally. I did have to take notes. I'm sorry, I'm older. I don't remember everything as well. So I actually have to go back and re-watch all of these. But, um, so, uh, yeah, I have my notes. I am going to be occasionally looking down. Just bear with me. But this had King Booker, Finley, Jeff Hardy, CM Punk, Mr. Kennedy... Matt Hardy, Randy Orton, and Edge. Okay, right off the bat, this was definitely one of the more exciting Money in the Bank ladder matches. It was CM Punk's first appearance at WrestleMania, and they made a big deal about that also because he was the first ever ECW star to compete at a WrestleMania, which actually, no, that would have been Rob Van Dam in 2002, but he was under the ECW banner, which... I won't get to touch on this really again the rest of the time I do these. The whole ECW run with WWE was kind of a sham anyways. I, I thought it was stupid. I think it spit on the name of ECW, which you're going to you're gonna hear more about that later because there's an ECW match later in the show as well. Um, and even with Lashley in his match. But um, yeah, the match was good. There was a lot of high spots. Um... The Hardys did what the Hardys did. Um, he ended up having, like, at one point, like, Mr. Uh, Kennedy. I wanted to call him Anderson because that's what he is in um, TNA. The dude, he was good. And I think that he brought a lot to the table for WWE when he was there. And I think they underused him. And it was a shame that he was let go. And it was a shame that we didn't get to see more from him. But, you know, what can you do? You know? Um... But he tried to do a, a Kenton bomb on Matt Hardy, and Hardy moved, and Anderson actually ended up hitting his head. Probably ended up giving himself an injury, concussion, or whatever. 
you, yeah, you ended up seeing lots of high spots. Um, <laughs> the RKO off the ladder, the bookend off the ladder uh, onto Orton. There was one point where Jeff Hardy had a chance to climb the ladder and win the match. He had Matt holding Edge on the ladder, trying to get him to come down. And what does Jeff do? Jeff being crazy, Jeff that he was, jumps off the ladder, but first goes through Edge in the ladder. Both men ended up being taken out of the match, and neither of them ended up returning. Um, lots of exchanges during this match. Um, there was a part where Matt almost was able to win the match. Keem Booker was climbing. He was climbing. Matt had to, you know, was trying to stop him. Charmel climbed in and grabbed freaking Matt's leg. Tried keeping him from getting up there. So he gets down, grabs her, threatens to put her in a twist of fate if Booker doesn't come down. So Booker gets down, ends up getting a twist of fate for his trouble, and Finley ends up hitting Matt Hardy. You end up with Hornswoggle at one point in this match, trying to climb the ladder to help Finley, who's beat up. And Kennedy goes up there, Hornswoggle hits him a couple times, and he ends up doing a freaking plunge off the top of the ladder with little three-foot-tall Hornswoggle, maybe 70 pounds, 100 pounds max, and ends up rolling into a plunge with him. I'm surprised, uh... He didn't get hurt. But you finally ended up getting the end of the match. CM Punk was on the ladder. Kennedy gets another ladder. Hits Punk, knocking him down. He climbs the ladder. He gets the briefcase. Overall, that was a fantastic match. I love Money in the Bank. Money in the Bank is still one of my favorite matches. I think it's become a little cliche where they have a pay-per-view every year. Um, but it was fun. <clears throat> back then. And yeah, you're probably going to hear some cats in the background playing behind me. Meow! Who cares? Um, but yeah, that was Money in the Bank. It was, yeah, it was a good match. And um, afterwards, they showed some uh, clips for the premiere of The Condemned. Um, I have nothing to say either way about the movie. I like Austin, but it was a WWE-funded premiere. There you go. Then Kennedy had an interview um, where he congratulated himself on being Mr. Money in the Bank. And he put out, it was a short interview, but it was a good interview. Kennedy, Anderson, whatever you want to call him, has always been phenomenal on the microphone. And he basically said, whoever's the champion, grow eyes in the back of your head, I'm going to be the next champion. But if you know, about a month later, Edge got the briefcase and then Edge ended up cashing in money in the bank and winning the title. So, sorry, Kennedy, you lose. Next was the interpromotional match between the Great Collie and Kane. Um, this was basically a filler match. Um, I didn't care going into WrestleMania at the time. Ten years ago, I was 20, 21. I was in Iraq, so I mean, I didn't get to know too much anyways, but... I honestly didn't care uh, what happened either way with this because I wasn't a fan of Kane, who was on SmackDown. I was a Raw guy. I liked to watch Raw at that time. Kali, at the time, yeah, looked like a beast. He looked like a monster who could really hurt somebody. Uh, of course, you know, throughout his career, he got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't really... I just... I didn't really look at this. The match ended with Kane getting a... A choke bomb or whatever they were calling it by Kali. Kali pins him with one foot and then chokes him with his own chain afterwards. That was basically that match. I mean, on what was a really good pay-per-view overall, this one and one other really kind of stuck out like a sore thumb. Um, so I'm going to move on from that. Uh, if you have more to say about it, you can feel free to leave that in the comments and I'll be glad to talk more about it. So... Up next, <laughs> a promo for the Divas match. Uh, okay, I will touch on this a lot more, but I, I have to say, at this time, women's wrestling 
wasn't great. There was a few exceptions for the women who were wrestling on the roster, like a Michelle McCool or a Melina or a Mickey James. But other than that, honestly, it, it was a poor, a really piss poor roster. Some of the women who were on the roster at the time have gone on, like Maria. She's gone on to other places and has gotten vastly better. Um, but pretty much otherwise, yeah. Then you see Crime Time back with Eugene backstage. He just got shaved bald, Eugene had, and they're trying to cheer him up and said, oh, well, let's have a party. And they start dancing the music and you see Kelly Kelly, Layla, and Brooke Tessmacher. You may know her from TNA. She was, yeah, she was in WWE for a little bit. They are Kelly Kelly's Extreme Expo, I think was the name of it. Um, they were backstage, and I had to write this down. There's a list of people who showed up backstage for this. You ended up with <laughs> Moolah and Mae Young, Slick, Hall of Famer Dusty Rhodes, Jimmy Hart, IRS, Mr. Rotundo, Mean Gene Hokerlin, Sergeant Slaughter, Pat Patterson, Jerry Briscoe, Ricky Steamboat, and a whole bunch. I think I even saw Howard Finkel in the back. And who knows else who was in there and you just barely could catch glimpses of. It basically became an old people orgy. Old people dance orgy. Um, in the end, it's Ron Simmons walking up and doing his famous damn uh, to end it. And then they go back to dancing. It, it is what it is. That was WWE in 2007. Okay, this next match. Um, I wasn't sure how to approach this match because it was a good match. But it involved somebody who is touchy to talk about, and that's Chris Benoit. Now, whatever your personal feelings about the situation that involved Chris Benoit and his family, I'm not here to discuss that. I'm here to discuss a pay-per-view. I'm here to discuss the matches on that pay-per-view. And I don't think it was fair to skip over MVP's match, whether you were an MVP fan or not, or still are, or whatever. It's not fair for me to do that. So I will preference this, or preference this by saying whatever you think is fine. I have my personal feelings about it. Cool. But I'm going to discuss this because it's a part of the review. It was a match at this pay-per-view, and it deserves to be talked about. And I won't go no further than that. I am either I am neither way when it comes to Chris Benoit. And I'm going to leave it at that. But, as far as the match goes, MVP wrestled a good match. MVP was stiff. He showed that he could keep up with Chris Benoit when it came to wrestling, because Chris Benoit was a good wrestler. He was one of the best wrestlers. Um... He was stiff. Um, he worked on Benoit's arm throughout the match. Uh, he really showed. I don't know if they were going to push him for the U.S. title when they went into this match. Because um, people were still iffy about MVP. But he showed that that night that he was a good wrestler. And he could keep up with Chris Benoit. Um, they did do a lot of exchanges for a while. And he started working on Benoit's arm and shoulder. And he kept that up. But Benoit... Ended up hitting like six German suplexes. MVP tried to reverse it at one point, but he still ended up finishing it off. And <laughs> these cats are going crazy back there. Y'all should take a peek at that. I think that's what I'm going to put in for my ending clip is the cats playing. Um, but he ended up doing a diving headbutt and got the victory. So Chris Benoit retained his U.S. title. And I'm moving on. You see Donald Trump backstage on the phone uh, talking to someone about how, you know, 80,000 people, he's being treated like crap, no food, nothing to drink, he's with, there with Miss USA. Boogeyman shows up, Boogeyman, I'm coming to get you, and he says, good, go get me a drink, give me something, I'm hungry, I'm about to go on soon, I'm, you know, and then Boogeyman, oh, Boogeyman, I'm coming to get you a sandwich, and he leaves. And then I saw little Boogeyman. Okay, moving on. So they showed highlights of the, the Hall of Fame ceremony the night before WrestleMania that year. The 2007 class, not the greatest class uh, for um, the Hall of Fame. 
but they had three or four really good people in it. And of course, after they showed the the highlights of the ceremony, they actually brought them out on the stage. And then you had the Wild Samoans, the, the original Sheik, Nick Bockwinkle. I'm still not sure why he got brought into the Hall of Fame class, but okay. Mr. Fuji, good old JR, Jim Ross, Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning. You had the whole Henning family out there to, you know, accept the Hall of Fame for him. Jerry the King Lawler, and most definitely deserving Dusty Rhodes. Um, I'm glad WWE didn't just hold what you did in WWE as to why you deserve to be Hall of Fame, because they got everything under their umbrella, AWA, NWA, WCW, all that. I think even Mid-South Wrestling and um, Rocky Mountain Wrestling, I think all falls under their tree. And uh, so I, I'm glad that they put like a guy like Dusty Rhodes in. It was nice to see him, but that's pretty much all it was. You know, there was nothing outside of that. Now, here's one gripe I have about this WrestleMania. As good as it was, with the crowd that it had, you had The Undertaker, who won the Royal Rumble. And this was the second year in a row they did this. Undertaker won the Royal Rumble. And Undertaker is not a Rey Mysterio, okay? He's not a lot of the guys who have won the Rumble. He's the freaking Undertaker. And he was going into this 14-0 at WrestleMania. And this match was halfway through the show. Two hours in. Maybe even a little earlier than that. And yes, it was a good match. It was a really, really good match. Why the fuck was this match not the main event? I thought the point of winning the Royal Rumble was to go to WrestleMania to main event. They're like, ah, oh, it was a main event match. It was one of the main events. But why did it not go on second to last at least? No, it was halfway through the card, halfway through the show. That's stupid. Shawn Michaels and John Cena, great match, had almost an hour that they got to do. The last hour belonged to them. Now, I'm not going to go on and on about this because people are going to start thinking, well, why did you pick this to be your 10th favorite WrestleMania? If you're constantly complaining. Those suckers are going crazy back there. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. It, this is not, I'm keeping this all in. This is life, all right? Life happens. Um, but I'm going to talk about the match. It should have been the main event. Batista comes out, freaking Teddy Long, worst general manager in history, introduces him, introduces The Undertaker. I don't know why they did that. Maybe they the, the, the celebrity they wanted couldn't show up. <clears throat> I guess William Garcia needed a break for some water or something. Undertaker's entrance, though. That was amazing. That was a A-plus freaking entrance. Um, I'm going to see. I'm seeing M a lot. I'm going to bring this up here so I don't look as bad. But, yes. Anyways. Um, the way the light, that white light just came on, and you just saw the silhouette of The Undertaker as he starts walking ominously towards the ring. I, I loved it. I, I ate that shit up. I know Undertaker is really a person, but I, I've i always loved the entrances of The Undertaker. Every WrestleMania, they try to make it a little different, a little bit cooler, and this was just one of the good ones. I think the one at 21, though, was kind of lame. <laughs> Um, once the bell rang, Batista literally went straight for The Undertaker, and that match, from start to finish, was a slugfest. These two guys went at it, and it was it's, it's cool to know that The Undertaker and his last string of matches, up till probably about WrestleMania 30, were all really good matches. Um, this man was hitting his 40s, coming into his 50s, and was putting on top-notch A-plus matches every year at Mania. And at this time, he was still wrestling year-round. Uh, my, little, my little light keeps killing. Um, but yeah, the bell sounded. Batista went straight for him. Those two, they, they just kept going at it. Uh, they fought a lot on the outside of the ring. Just a lot of hard blows. And Batista had control for a little bit. And then it kept going back and forth. And 
it, it, it didn't stop for a while. I'm sorry, I keep getting distracted. I keep having to look at my notes because this was a, this was a long pay-per-view and I've had a long day. Let's see. Yeah, they kept the brutality level in this match for a guy like, especially with Undertaker at his age. It was it was something. Um, they went about twenty minutes or so in this twenty thirty minutes also. Batista kept using the power moves. Um, Undertaker, he you know did his thing, and I miss him doing this. Did the dive over the rope, hit Batista. Um, they kept going out ringside. Batista ended up getting Undertaker over his shoulder at one point on top of the tables. Did a running power slam to the Undertaker through the tables. And, of course, you know, they, oh, my God, Undertaker's dead. We heard him. He's a man. Ah, you know, Michael Cole. Turn down. Got back into the ring. Uh, Undertaker ended up hitting the last ride out of the corner. Freaking choke slams. They both kept, you know, Batista bombs, Flying Busters. They just kept kicking out. They kept going and going and going. And this was an exciting match. The crowd was into it. Of course, they were behind The Undertaker. They wanted to see that 15-0. They wanted to see Undertaker be a world champion finally for the first time since 2002. But Undertaker ended up countering um, the Batista bomb. Batista countered choke slams. They kept doing counter after counter. And finally, Undertaker hit the tombstone. Got the win. Crowd went insane over this match. They ate that stuff up. They, they loved The Undertaker. I was happy to see The Undertaker win when I finally got to see this. He did a celebration. Batista walked off, and this led to a series of great matches between these two at Backlash. And then on SmackDown, which led to Edge cashing in his money in the bank eventually. And then he had his matches with Batista. It led to a lot of good things. You know, this was kind of stupid. Stephanie shows up with a crib, or with a, a roller, or stroller. I'm sorry, I'll get it. A stroller. Supposedly with her first kid, her daughter, her first daughter. <coughs> and Vince is back there. And Vince's like, oh, it's my niece. But he starts talking crazy, looking into the stroller. And you got a camera coming out of the stroller. I've, and it it looks like like it looks at Vince, like the, I guess it's supposed to be the baby's point of view. It's just weird. He kept talking crazy about bloodying up Donald Trump and hey, what you talk to a baby about? What the hell, man! All right, the next match, and this is where my second gripe comes in. They talked about how ECW was a part of this pay per view, and this was a big time thing because this is the first time ECW, the originals, were at. They had this thing. They were no longer these small bingo hall wrestling people or anything of that nature. They weren't bingo hall wrestlers. They were in the big time. WrestleMania. They got seven minutes. They gave them seven freaking minutes. They first took CM Punk and he was this close. Couldn't get the job done against a Ken Anderson. Ken Kennedy. Then they had the ECW originals, which were Sandman, Rob Van Dam, Sabu, and Tommy Dreamer. Taking on Kevin Thorne, uh, a.k.a. Uh, the dude with white hair, don't remember his name, with some um, Aaliyah. You know their name? Yeah, Aaliyah. <laughs> Elijah Burke. Marcus Corvon, which you'll remember him for, as the alpha male in TNA. And Matt Stryker. The teacher. Ooh, so scary. This match was another filler match. This was just so they could say, yeah, okay, you ECW guys, we'll um, we'll throw you out there. We'll give you seven minutes so you can kill a little time so you don't have to kill Cena and HBK later. Have fun following up the Undertaker match, by the way. Good luck with that. This match, like I said, it was okay. Um, it was basically a filler match. They worked on Tommy Dreamer most of the match. Kept him, kept working on him and tagging in and whatnot. He finally got a hat tag to RVD who cleared house. But then his momentum was killed by um, freaking getting hit from the outside. But he ended up still getting the five-star frog splash and still ended up getting the pin. It just... 
the way they built the ECW in this, it almost was like they were trying to smack ECW in the face. Like, yeah, we know you're a promotion, but now we own you. We're going to run you as a brand. We're not going to really make you like ECW. You're going to be WWE with the ECW label. And that just, that really, it irked me a little bit. You know what I mean? But, it is what it is, I guess. I can't change it. It's in the past. It was still a good WrestleMania. Next was the Battle of the Billionaires. Donald Trump with Umaga, the Intercontinental Champion, who came out with Armando Estrada. You've heard him. And then Bobby Lashley. Oh, yeah. Bobby Lashley being bumped, being backed by Donald Trump. Umaga being backed by Vince McMahon. And Lashley was the ECW Champion. Again, this match was all Umaga. Austin was the special referee. They really put a point on Austin. Not a wrestler. He was the referee. But he was a focal point. And that's understandable. He's Stone Cold Steve Austin, okay? He deserves that. And, you know, the match, the match started out okay. Austin had a great ovation. But the crowd wasn't really into this. And as I go through this, you're, you're going to kind of see where my frustration with this whole ECW thing comes through. Um, lots of power moves. A couple big guys. Lashley has never been a great wrestler to me. Um, he was the Army Ranger. They tried to push Lashley. I really think they believed Lashley had the opportunity to be the next big guy in the company. It, it just never worked out. Lashley's tenure there was short, which is tragic. But anyways, um, Estrada tried getting involved early. Lashley ended up actually like picking him up and power slamming him. Got him kind of pushed out of the way. And then Umaga took over. Umaga dominated this match. Every time Lashley would start to get a little offense, Umaga would just hit him back. There's times he wouldn't want to break a hold and also would have to pull him back. And Umaga would just look at him. And finally, at one point, Umaga gave him a Samoan spike, knocking him down. Um... But then he ended up getting back into momentum. and ended up getting right back. And then Austin had to do it in. And Austin ended up getting pushed back out of the ring. And it really just kind of kind of all blew up. Um, yeah, Lashley, like, a couple times would throw him out off the top rope. Um, finally, when Austin got a Samoan, stri a Samoan spike and pushed out, Shane McMahon came out. Because Vince got knocked off the apron. And Shane got in there. It became a two-on-one assault. Shane ended up pulling off his shirt and had a referee shirt on, so he was trying to pin Lashley. I mean, they made Lashley look weak in this match. Like, he couldn't take Umaga. He's supposed to be this big guy, ECW champion, the next big thing, and he looked weak. And I think it's because Vince honestly just wanted to kind of humiliate ECW on the stage, the biggest stage of them all. He wanted to make ECW look kind of bad. I could be wrong. It's just my opinion Everyone, you're free to tell me if I'm wrong or stupid or whatever. Feel free. Um, so, Shane's about to make the count after Umaga gets the Samoan spike. <gasps> That's moving behind me. It must be a ghost. Uh, I'm getting sidetracked. My <laughs> bad. Um, Austin pulls Shane out, beats the tar out of him, gets back in the ring. Umaga is kind of in control. Umaga tries to give him a Samoan spike yet again. Austin ducks. Gives him a stunner. He stumbles back. Lashley gives him a spear. Gets the pin. And then they're talking about how Lashley's resilient. And Lashley is, you know, there's a reason he's the champion. But then you look back at the match. It was literally all Umaga in this match. It was a slow match. It wasn't even a long match. It was like maybe 10 minutes. It was slow methodical, and it, it had, there was nothing interesting about this match. It was one of the low points of the night, except for what I'm talking about after. That was bad. Austin, like, you know, the stunner happened. He got the 1-2-3 over Umaga. Vince tried to run away. Austin pulls him back in the ring. They kind of corner him. Shane gets in the ring. Gets a stunner for his troubles. Vince is kind of sneaking off. Almost gets away, and then Lashley grabs him, pulls him back to the ring. They have the chair set up. With the Clippers, and they shave McMahon bald. Cue ball McMahon. It was funny. That was the best part of the match, was Vince getting shaved. Um, 
so Vince walked away and you know that shame uh, oh I feel so bad that look on his face <laughs> uh, um, Austin ended up giving uh, when he got the beers he gave Donald Trump a stunner hey Austin Trump's running for president will you give him a stunner and break his neck please I'm not endorsing anyone. I just, I just hate, I hate Donald Trump. Um, so then this match happened. Lumberjill match for the women's championship. All the divas surrounding the ring at one time. So Molina, who's a good wrestler, can wrestle Ashley Mazzaro, who was a Playboy Bunny, and they thought should be pushed to be the next big thing because they didn't have Lita anymore. Beth Phoenix was still injured. And hadn't came back yet. So then they could also have her replace Lita, who was a good wrestler. Mickey James, who they thought was overweight, so they didn't want to push her yet. Thank God Melina won this match. I didn't care to watch this match. I waited, I looked at the ending and was going, okay. Some of you might say I'm being a little harsh on her because, oh, well, she could have worked on it. No, Ashton Mazzara was a waste of money, a waste of time. A waste of anything you could possibly think of. Ashley Mazzara was a waste. She had a good body and a pretty face, somewhat. And they thought, we can market her. She'd be the next Trish Stratus. Trish wasn't a great wrestler. Except the fact that Trish got better, consistently better, every time she stepped in the ring. Ashley was a botch fest. She was slow. She moved like freaking sand. <clears throat> you know, you, you hear about, you know, they moved as smooth as water. It was a nice, even flow. Well, she'd be like trying to walk through sand, okay? She was just horrible, okay? I couldn't stand her. Even then, I, I just, I did not want to see her. And I understand wrestling was bad at this time. There was a few exceptions, like Melina was a good wrestler. She took time to develop too, but she did develop. Ashley was there for two years and never got any better. Her promos were shit. I just didn't like her. I didn't, I didn't even care to look at Playboy, and I was a teenager. Still, no, no. I was in my 20s at the time. Still didn't care to see her in a Playboy. Roll up for a pin. Molina won, kept the title, and a fight broke out at the end. And yay. And they moved on from her. That was her only title shot, and they didn't, they didn't even... She became a bad afterthought afterwards. They realized, because she had no response when she was there, they realized, hey, she, she ain't gonna work. We're just moving on. She hasn't gotten no responses. And throughout the night, they kept showing these vignettes for, you know, all grown-ups. They showed Cena and King Booker and Lashley and Batista. And I liked them. I thought they were cute and they were funny, seeing these kids come up there and try to be their favorite superstars and try to be them in these little vignettes. You know, fake crowd, fake ring. It was cute. I liked them. They, they were cool. <sighs> Next came the main event. As I said earlier, I thought Batista and... Uh, Undertaker should have been the main event. But, for the fact that it wasn't, this match was a 30-minute classic. It was the stuff that you hope to see a main event. And not many main events since have lived up to what this is. Now, granted, it's a lot of John Cena haters, and I am not a John Cena fan. But, Shawn Michaels managed to bring the best out of him in this match and due to the fact that Triple H had got injured they ended up replacing him with Shawn Michaels because it was supposed to be Triple H, Triple H against John Cena again now like I said this was a 30 minute match it was exhausting watching this match because the, the pace was good everything about this match was good and some people may disagree with me saying oh it was slow Zach it, it just felt like it was dragging on. I think it could have been quicker. No. Shawn Michaels and John Cena. And I'm not saying no as in you're wrong. I'm saying no as in stop and look at what they were doing. Shawn Michaels and John Cena were telling a story. It was a it was a strategy of Shawn Michaels. How he was going to show John Cena, the, the young guy, what wrestling really was. And he put a clinic on John Cena in this match. He 
this was around the time that John Cena started getting all his detractors. And this was a very pro HBK crowd. Sean went in there, they had their little stare down, and then Sean just sucker punched him. So, and, and from that point on, it was punch, miss, knife edge chops out the ass. I mean, Cena's chest was blistered pretty much by the end of this match. And like I said, this was a long match, and I had to write it down. And I'm going to try to go through this as much as I can, but, you know, C you know, HPK came out, Cena, he hit his little thing with the Mustang, which is cool. <sighs> HPK, for the early part of this match, had full control. He was trash-talking, he looked like the old HBK in this match. That D-Generation X HBK. Man, my brain is just like on fire. Cena, you know, he tried to get a few moves in, but he couldn't really do so. I mean, he was just being schooled. HBK was clearly the better wrestler in this match, but Cena, at a point, finally stepped up his A game. HBK was aggressive. He kept going for the leg. He ended up doing this, this springboard moonsault was seen up against the table and like bit Cena in half. I mean, it was, it was, it was beautiful to watch the way these two moved in this ring, the way that they made it look good. He started working on the leg. He went for this this running shoulder into the gut. Cena moved. HBK busted his head open. HBK ended up trying to give sweet chin music to Cena. Cena ducked, and he freaking ended up hitting the referee. There was several times. That Cena went for the AA in this match and it kept getting reversed. And I wrote them down. Here's the first of the few ones. Let's see. Okay. He reversed it into a chop. He ended up reversing it into this freaking pin combination. That was just a few of them. Um, every time he tried it, he had a counter. Um, let's see where am I at? So Cena went after the referee went down. Both men they were just kind of laying there. They're exhausted. You could this was about 15 minutes in, and they had already worn each other out. Cena gets up. HBA gets HBK gets up. Cena goes for another AA. It gets reversed into the DDT. <laughs> I mean, these guys just kept doing it. HBK gets out of the ring, clears the steps off. Freaking gives a pile driver. But Cena's head open in the back. They go back in, exchange of freaking chops and fists. Momentum kept going in HBK's way. He kept the momentum going throughout the match. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my throat's kind of... HBK, he even went for a super kick, which got reversed. Um, finally, Cena hit the AA, went for the cover, only got a two count. I'm sorry, you see me stand like this. This match was long. I had to write this down, and I have to kind of look at it because my brain is fried, people. Watch this match and tell me how your brain feels, okay? Yeah, I hear you laughing. Um, so, this was the end of the match. Cena goes for the AA. Gets reversed. Cena attempts the STFs. Twice. Both times it got reversed. HBK ends up freaking and reverses that into a, like a, a cradle pin. He gets up. Cena goes for another AA. It gets reversed. Cena gets him into the STF and he's holding him. Both are bleeding and finally HBK gives up. This match watching it, like I said, it exhausts you. This led to Cena still being the champion until like October um, man, these two men, they put on a clinic. Again, not a Cena fan, but Cena, he did his part in this match. He played his part really well. And I can't do this match justice talking about it. I honestly, I can't. You hear me say that a lot. I can't do this justice. I can't do that justice. No, I legit can't do this match justice. I recommend, if you don't already have it, get the WWE Network and go back and watch this match. That's what I'm kind of hoping to do here. Is I'm hoping 
I'm, I'm hoping to get people to go back and to look at these matches. I'm, here I am, 40 minutes in, my throat's getting dry. Um, I, just, I want people to see these and to be like, oh man, well that sounds interesting. This, these matches, the matchups sound great. This moment's like Edge going through a burning table with freaking Mick Foley. Uh, there's just so many moments for these WrestleManias. And moments are great, but overall, this pay-per-view was not great, but it's still better than the other 21 WrestleManias that I saw. Um, but it's not the best. So, ah, uh, yeah, these two... The main things that stood out to me was Undertaker and Batista. Shawn Michaels and freaking John Cena... Just, yeah, an MVP's match was good. I hope that one day we can get back to having matches like this. I mean, because this was actually, it was a classic. HBK, Sean, uh, HBK and Cena was a classic. So before my throat becomes any more shot and I can't get the words out any further, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to call it. Um, I'm going to give these scores. I'm going to give these scores throughout this series. Um, I'm giving this... A 7.7 .7 out of 10. That is my score for this WrestleMania. It's a little low, mainly because I was really irked by the ECW thing, because I liked the original ECW, and I just think if I felt it was unjustly treated badly. So, with that all being said, if you like this video, hit that like button. You can subscribe to our channel, follow us on all our social media. Speaking of, I have an announcement. Uh, I want to get this out of the way while I'm thinking about it. I am setting up a new Twitter account this week for the channel. So once it's up, I'll have the link to that down in the description. Please come there, follow us. You'll have all the up-to-date things for our channel there. We'll be setting up a new Facebook. So anyways, all the information is going to be down in the description. Follow us. This was my first Road to WrestleMania series, episode one. For WrestleMania 23, thank you all for watching. God bless America, and good night. I will see you all tomorrow. Peace out. Uno. And dos. And... <laughs> Just going in like at the end also. Why don't Joby tell us all the story? I want to put this in at the no. end. <laughs> Oh, come on, Joey. I ain't say nothing. I ain't say the word. What's up? What's up? <laughs> uh...